All right, this is about the, what we'll be studying. This characteristic of God is His goodness. And trying to understand that characteristic <clears throat> in light of justice and mercy. Justice and mercy. Sometimes they seem to be opposite things. When we think of, or when I think of justice, I think of a person who, you know, uh, back in the old cowboy days, they'd take somebody out in the front and, you know, when they had done something bad and strang them up, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we kind of say, well, that's justice. That's, and sometimes God dealt with people that way in the sense of immediate justice. Sometimes God's justice was delayed. You'll see some of that tonight. And then how does that compare with God's mercy? When does God determine that it's time for just, justice to take place? And when is it time to show mercy? <clears throat> In this book, this, these 11 chapters, cha Psalm 73 through 83 is what we're looking at tonight, written by Asaph. Uh, Asaph was one of the three choir leaders. Uh, it's believed that David had established three choirs. And Asaph led the, the choir from Gershon, which was one of the places of worship. And one of the groups was led by David, or David and his close advisors. But then there was a third group led by Korah, or the sons of Korah. And uh, they, were, they led that worship group. <clears throat> this was written by, <clears throat> these, uh, these uh, psalms were written by Asaph. And they really reveal the attitude I think the attitude of of the children of Israel, some of the things that you'll see look pretty hard in their attitude, and they they want to blame God a lot for everything that goes bad in their life, and uh, and yet their hearts are far from Him many times, and so it, it's kind of amazing that you, have you ever had an argument at least internally with God? Question God about some things. You didn't like how God was doing some things. You complained a little bit. You whined a little bit. And then you got mad. And then you got over it. It's kind of the process of grief. And, and so that's, we see that lived out in these Psalms. We see them not understanding, God, where's your justice? We usually like justice to be on other people. And we want mercy to be on us. And we want God to do things now, not when he wants to do it. And so we see all of that talked about in our text today. And so hopefully you'll pick up. We're just going to pick up some verses out of these, these 11 chapters and uh, uh, some topics, really. All right. In Psalm 73, we see it begins by talking about how good God had been to Israel. God's goodness <clears throat> to Israel. I didn't make a worksheet with blanks um, this week. I just wanted to put it on the screen. If you want to write it, there's places to write on your, your handout here today. You can just write some of these things. But in Psalm 73, just talk, they talk about how good God had been to them. And then we see there in the very next two verses... Uh, it says, but as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Boy, you can see somebody. I don't know about you too. When I read these psalms, I'm thinking, these are songs. They don't sound very like songs to me, <laughs> you know. I'm like, it'd be hard to put to music, some of these songs. But uh, uh but you see what's going on in the hearts of the people, the leaders, even, because he said they were envious of those that were boastful. And you, you understand what he means by boastful, the people who had a lot to brag about, the people who were pretty arrogant about some things, maybe the prosperous, those who had practiced or had prosperity in their day. And so he became envious, desirous of those who had, had developed prosperity of their day, even if they were wicked people. 
And he didn't fully understand. The psalmist didn't understand why they were blessed. <clears throat> Let me give you a Jewish uh, teaching. Jewish people believe that if you are financially blessed, that means God is smiling on you. Okay? If you are financially blessed, God is smiling on you. And therefore, they couldn't understand when Jesus said, it's easier for a rich man, it's easier for a rich man to go through the eye of the needle than, to, than for him to get into heaven. Now, whether you take that parable, that example, as literal or not, did it literally mean for a man to get through the eye of a needle? Or if you take it as a, a symbolic thing, because there was a gate, there was a small gate in the wall of Jerusalem that was called the eye of the needle, and a camel could go through that gate, but a camel, for a camel to get through that gate, he had to get on his knees, they had to strip all the saddle and everything off of him, and it was all he could do on his knees to squeeze through that gate. Most people believe that's probably what he was talking about, because obviously no man can go through the eye of a needle. So that would be like saying it's impossible for a man to get into heaven, because he can't get through the eye of a needle. So it's more than likely he was saying for the rich man to get into heaven, he's going to have to make some adjusting. And he's just barely going to make it because many times, many times, gold was his God. He worshipped what he had. And so when Jesus taught that, he just blew their mind because they had always believed if you were rich, <laughs> you were going to have the best seats in heaven. You, were, you, you had it made. God was smiling on you. And Jesus came along and basically said, no, that's not true at all. And basically from his teachings, he talks about the poor man who, who died and went to Abraham's bosom and the rich man who went to hell, you know. And, and so it, Jesus almost tells us that those who have the least, it would really be probably a little easier for them to get into heaven than it would for the wealthy because of their allegiance and their, their passion. And so we look at this today, and the psalmist here was, was in confusion about the wicked and about those in prosperity. Psalm 74, uh, God's people thought he was, he was, he in his anger was finished with them forever. Uh, and, and by the way, I, I should just add, I could spend a little more time on that, that first psalm, but, but never forget, and, and I do reference this here in just a moment, uh, when he got his thinking right, does anybody remember when he got his thinking right? Verse 17 of 73, chapter 73, verse 17. He said, all I was thinking about was all these rich people. He said, until I went to the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. It's almost like he went to church and he heard a sermon. And when he heard that sermon, that sermon said, oh, no. It's like he went and heard Jesus preach. And Jesus said, no, no, no. He's going to have a hard time getting, getting into heaven. And he said, then I understood. And he went on to say, you have set them in a slippery place. You cast them down to destruction uh, that they might be brought to desolation as in a moment <clears throat> and utterly consumed with terrors. In other words, I don't know about you, but in this part of the country on a rainy day on a red clay hill, you ever try to walk up a red clay hill on a rainy day <laughs> when it's wet? And I mean, you can't take a step without your feet slipping out from under you. And basically he's saying, that's what I've done with these rich folks. I set them on the side of a red clay hill on a rainy day. And when they slip and fall, it's going to lead to their destruction. And so he said, that's where we get that sermon, payday someday. R.G. Lee preached that sermon, payday someday. There's a payday someday. You may, get, you may be prospering now according to the world standards, but there's a payday someday. So never forget that, okay? 
when you see somebody prospering like some of the rich folks today, listen, you can be rich and be some of the most evil people in the world. Prosperity does not mean God is smiling on you. You may have stolen everything you have, <laughs> okay? All right, so God's people thought he was, his anger was finished with them, and God <clears throat> really was angry with them throughout this. In verse 1, it says, O oh God, why have you cast us off forever? Why does your anger smote against the sheep of your pasture? Why do you think they were under the, they felt the heavy hand of God upon them? Anybody? Have an idea? <clears throat> well, several of their enemies were fighting against them. The Edomites uh, were fighting against them. The Midianites and different ones, uh, they, were, they were surrounding them. They, were, uh, they had all kind of, of uh, possible destruction facing them. And so life just wasn't easy for them. And because of that, they thought that was the hand of God on them. And I'm not saying it wasn't. Because of many things they had said and done, uh, they may have been experiencing some of the judgment of God. But isn't it amazing how that sometimes our thinking gets way outside? You know, I, I look at this first verse where he says, Why have you cast us off forever? You think God had cast them off forever? Sometimes we feel that way, don't we? We, I don't know if you've ever gotten away from God and didn't know if you could find God again. Didn't know if you could find God. And that's how they felt. They just felt like God was through with them. And uh, it shows how extreme our thinking can be sometimes. We can, we can decide pretty soon that, our, that we just think God hadn't done anything to help us in a while. Because everything's not going our way. Look at verses 10 and 11 about justice here. He talks about justice. Again, they're desiring justice. How do we find justice in these actions? Where's the mercy of God? In 74 verses 10 and 11. <clears throat> oh God, how long will, will the adversary reproach? Will the enemy blaspheme your name forever? That's those enemies that were around them, that were attacking them and... and uh, making life hard for them. And so he says here, Why do you withdraw your hand, even your right hand? Take it out from of your bosom and destroy them. We always tend to know what God needs to do, don't we? We sometimes, let's be honest, sometimes I think we think we see, we understand things better than God. Right or wrong? Is that possible that we might think that? We think we know what God needs to do, and we think we know when God needs to do it. Right? And you know, the fact is, a lot of times, we don't really even know what God needs to do. Because chances are, you don't know the whole story. You ever hear anybody say, there's three sides to every story? There's his side, there's her side, and then there's the truth in the middle somewhere. Well, you know, that's the way it is about issues that we're facing in this life. We don't understand it all. God understands it all. We don't understand it all. He knows the whole story. He knows this story and that side of the story. He knows this part of the story. He knows parts of the story you don't even know about yet. And he knows. <clears throat> Can you imagine being in a place when you know not only this story... But there's a million other stories that are connected to it. And you need to make sure all the pieces come together for your perfect will. And God is moving stuff around. I think of that verse when, you know, Galatians 4, 4 says, that When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son. We don't know how many things God moved around before He sent His Son to make it the right time for Jesus to come. And so <clears throat> how do we find justice in these actions? We, we don't fully understand why God's not moving now. Why God allows 
Israel to have adversaries. <clears throat> you see, Israel thought they were so special to God that God ought to just jump at everything they need. Now get this, no matter what they did that brought it on. God loved Israel so much that sometimes he allowed them to have a spanking. Sometimes he allowed them to walk outside of his will and miss his blessings. And so, justice. Our view of justice and God's is sometimes so different. Mercy. They don't understand. Maybe God is showing mercy to some adversary right now. But Israel's not into mercy at that point. They're into justice. And we think we have all the points, but we don't. We don't have all the answers. Where did the psalmist finally see the hand of God? That's what I mentioned a while ago. I just kind of misplaced that, <clears throat> that slide. That's when he went to the house or the sanctuary of God. What did the psalmist see? What did the psalmist see as the plight of the world? As I said, he set them on a slippery slope, a wet clay hill, and he prepared them for what was coming. <clears throat> in your outline, in your handout today, if you'll take just a minute, if you see page 48, it mentions that on there. If you observe God's law, you'll be blessed. But if you fail to observe the law, you'd be cursed. Now we kind of look at that as justice. I don't know about your copy. Mine's kind of got a lot of those copy, those pages cut off, page numbers cut off. And uh, <clears throat> I was trying to see which page, which part that was on. I don't. I can't tell which page is forty-eight. Uh, I was just talking about that part in that block up there on page 48 where it talks about being blessed. That's right out of the book. Uh, first paragraph on which page? Well, okay. I can't see it on the copy, though. I, and I didn't bring my book in here with me, so I was just using one of the copies. Here's what I want you to see. <clears throat> justice. Justice is sometimes in our mind when we think God takes care of everything just as he should. It'd be fair for us to say that as we study the scriptures, we believe if we trust God, if we walk with God, we'll be blessed. If we turn our backs on God, we'll find ourselves cursed. Cursed because we went one way and God went the other way. We find ourselves under the cursing of God, under the curses of God. Now, and one of the things we'll talk about here in a moment is that how does that happen? How do those times of cursing happen? Does it happen because God just punishes you? Or does it happen because God just kind of backs up and says, okay, you go your way without me and see what happens? Does he just let the world get at us? Or does God himself bring judgment in a person's life? Yeah. Time and again, God... God, I'd like to say God gives us an opportunity to be blessed... Gives us opportunity after opportunity to be blessed. And if we obey Him, we'll be blessed. But if we disobey Him, we miss out on a lot of those blessings. And sometimes when we miss out on the blessings of God, that's the same thing. I, I guess in some ways it's the same thing as a curse being cursed because we missed what God had for us. But it's something else, I think, when God specifically puts the weight of judgment on us. That weight 
that says it's kind of like that trip to the outhouse, I guess, that we sometimes find ourselves, uh, just like with our children, sometimes a trip to the outhouse does a little good. But looking at our lesson tonight, what is the justice that God speaks of? It's the punishment of God for disobedience or the consequences of our choices? What do you think it is? Well, that's kind of what I was getting to there, Brother Ed. I think there is a difference. The. Mm hmm. Yeah. Good example, great example. Yeah, Ed, I think there's a little difference. If we put it in money terms, just in dollar terms and senses, um, if I make bad choices, God, let's say God had a million dollars for me. I made some bad choices. I missed out on getting that million dollars because I made some bad choices. But if, if, I made some, if I did some things and God chose to punish me to make a point, not only did I not get the million dollars, it might have cost me even more. Might have been even more that I didn't get. That's just putting it in money terms. I, I believe with all of my heart, there's a difference in you wanting to to give your kids uh, a new bicycle and take them to the park and do some things with them, and they do some bad things, and you say, "Well, we're not going now." It's a big difference in just saying we're not going right now, we're not going to do those kind of things, or, or taking them out and selling their bicycles. You know, totally getting rid of them. But you won't ever have a bicycle again, you know. So I, I, there is a difference. They can be the I think they can be the same somewhat, or they overlap. But justice is that God dealing with our disobedience God actually bringing about a consequence or a punishment for that and then we're going to talk about mercy sometimes when it does <laughs> do you think that's something today that we're losing I'm sorry I didn't mean to cut you off Right. Yeah. Do y'all think that that's some one of the things that we're seeing in our world today that's disappearing? Just for example, in so many of these big cities now, you can steal stuff, but there's no consequences. No consequences to that. You don't go to jail. And won't that raise generations that feel there's no consequences for what they do? That feel there is no... I can do whatever I want to do. I don't have to take personal responsibility. I just, I just do what I think is right. So, but if there's no right and wrong, if there's no truth, then whoever does something has a right to determine their own truth. So therefore, there can't be consequences. You can't give me consequences if what I'm doing I think is right. There can't be consequences. So we, we are really battling with right and wrong in our, in our culture today. Let's look at the next one here. In Psalm 75 through 77, uh, we see 
them deal with these attitudes of self-sufficiency and boastfulness. Chapter 75 and verse 4, if you look there, I said to the boastful, do not deal boastfully, and to the wicked, do not lift up the horn, which was a sign of power in that day. <clears throat> do not deal boastfully. Uh, he said in Psalm 76, he reminds us of the wrath of God. Now we're going to bring the wrath of God into this. We're going to just grab some verses here and there, and I want you to see what God is, the point that's being made in these 11 chapters right here. Chapter 7, you yourself are to be feared, and who may stand in your presence when once you are angry? You cause judgment to be heard from heaven. The earth feared and was still. And when God arose to judgment to deliver all the oppressed of the earth, surely the wrath of man shall praise you. With the remainder of wrath, you shall gird yourself. The wrath of God. It seems to me that we're losing some of that. Recognition of that God is a God of, of wrath. When he chooses to be. And sometimes we can take this mercy. Again, we haven't really gotten to mercy yet, but... You can take mercy away where you think that there are no consequences. There is no judgment. There is no God of wrath. <clears throat> there is something to be feared about God. You hear what I'm saying? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the Bible says. What do you think that means? Who can tell me what that means? The fear of the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. I was the same way. Yeah, I loved my dad, but I was scared to death of him. <clears throat> and that's exactly what I think. That's the difference because you have a healthy fear of God, yeah. and in a relationship that comes from a relationship with Him, that yeah. that other guy doesn't. Have. And doesn't and doesn't that come that fear of God? Isn't it because we are we are now at a place where we doubt the judgment of God? We we just think God is is just a God of mercy. And what the psalmist here, what we're trying to see in these psalms tonight is the healthy balance between, between the judgment of God, the wrath of God, the fear of the Lord, and the mercy of God. And why does God sometimes exhibit mercy and then sometimes His wrath comes out? Why do you think that is? Mm -hmm. and God says go in and wipe out everybody. You know, that's hard for me to address with the fact that most of God is <clears throat> wiping out of those people were in creation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And why do why do we think God did that? Here's why this is hard for God, hard for us to understand. It's hard for us to understand because we can only see what we can understand. We can only see 
we can read the history, but we don't know anything about the future. God knew what those nations were going to do in the future. He knew those nations were a cancer that would never repent. He knew they were a cancer that was never going to turn to God. And God said, cut them out. They need to go under surgery, and those cancers have to be removed for the good of the bigger plan. Now, you can stand here and say, well, I don't think God had the right. Well, who do you think you are? You'd you be the same person saying God don't have the right to send people to hell in the end of time. You know what I'm saying? We're dealing with God here. We're not dealing with a president. We're not dealing with some king. We're not dealing with somebody who doesn't have all the information to make their decision. We're dealing with somebody who knows all the past. He didn't just make that decision based upon what happened that day. He made that decision based upon a history and a future. And he made that decision. Now, the world doesn't understand that. I mean, the world honestly looks at that and they say, well, that's no different than the Muslims' view of God. That's what the Muslims think they're doing when they go out there and when they'd like to kill all of us. That's what they're doing. Well, no, it's totally different. And at least in my view it is. Because they're doing theirs out of acts of war trying to conquer. And what we're doing is, I mean, what the Jewish people did there in the Old Testament was go in and say, okay, God, th God specifically said, wipe them out. He said, that's a cancer that's got to be removed. I'm putting that in my terms. <clears throat> no more mercy was going to do them any good. He knew that mercy wouldn't help turn them. And so he ended those people. And so God's very able to do that. You don't realize God could step in here today and end us? He could step in here today. And what if he did? What if he did? What if he stepped in? What if God stepped in today and ended America? You say, well, he don't have the right. That would be a bad God to do that. Friends, if you're his creation, he can do with you whatever he wants to do. And listen, he doesn't lose one kilowatt of glory when he does it. It's just like God in his sovereignty didn't owe you and I anything. He didn't have to save any one of us. He didn't have to. He chose to. If he had let all of us die, all of creation die and go to hell, would he have still been God? He sure would have. He'd have still been glorious. He wouldn't have lost any of his glory. He didn't have to save anybody, but he did. Chapter 77 in verse 1 reminds us that in judgment, God still has mercy. He says, verse 1, I cried out to God with my voice, to God with my voice, and he gave ear to me. You know, if God was only about judgment, and if God was only about wrath, and if God was only about, you know, punishing, he wouldn't give ear to us. Can you see the progression of the psalmist here? He goes to a place about how good God is. And then in the next chapter, he talks about how God has turned away from them and how God's not listening to them and casting them away. And then it moves on to, uh, you know, not understanding why God was waiting to show his wrath. And then here in chapter 77, he says, I cried out to God and, and God heard me. He listened. <clears throat> That's the cycle of healing. The cycle of healing is when something happens, typically we deny it, that process. If something bad happens, we deny that that really happened. And then out of that, or, or maybe, maybe it's anger first and then denial. I forget if somebody knows it's a circle. But we go through that anger and the denial and then finally begin to consider it and finally come back around and understand it the process of, of hurt and how to deal with that hurt. 
<clears throat> but it is a process uh, that we go through. Many times we misunderstand God's judgment. Um, why does God not deal with things today? Why does God sometimes delay His judgment? Many of you may remember um, Jezebel and others um, there in the Old Testament. Y'all may remember when Jezebel and King Ahab and all them, when they were under the judgment of God, and God said, I remember in that particular judgment, God said that the dogs, Jezebel, the dogs are going to lick your blood up in the streets right here. Well, guess what? That didn't happen this year. People said, well, that prophecy must have been wrong. No, it didn't happen in the second year. It didn't happen in the fifth year. It didn't happen in the tenth year. It didn't happen in the fifteenth year. Oh, but in the twentieth year, she was slain, and the dogs licked up her blood in the streets. Twenty years later. Why do you think that happens? Why does God delay sometimes his judgment? Huh? To see if you change? Well, I guess that's possible. What else? It's pretty miserable, isn't it? That's like when, when Mama used to say, when your daddy gets home, you're going to get a spanking. That was the, that was the longest day, wasn't it? You had to think about it all day long. <laughs> What if God, in delaying his judgment, God was giving us time to repent, obviously. But what if in delaying his judgment, God was also moving all the other pieces into place? There were things that needed to happen. There was, there was things that maybe people were going to be saved because of it. <clears throat> uh -huh. Do we think... Now, Mama... <laughs> There's some good people out there. But there's more monkey business goes on out there than you could see. In <laughs> it sure is. It's all over, isn't it? It ain't just out there. <laughs> there's several of them out there. John MacArthur, one of the strongest preachers in America, is out there. And uh, David Jeremiah is one of the best.
do you think, do you think, because we look at the condition of the world today and we think, well, is America under judgment? Are we under judgment right now? We don't, we don't know. Huh? Yeah, we, I've heard people say, well, they believe we're already under the judgment and it's just taking time to happen, but and there's a lot of other countries been here where we are for a lot longer than we have. You know, I, I believe God's allowing mercy right now in America when a lot of us maybe would like to see this judge. But, you know, here's what we want. We want to point out the things that we want judged. We want to pick what we want judged, and we don't want to let God pick what's judged. And I believe God's showing mercy in America right now because he, I believe his judgment could come down on our nation. I believe it would be a whole lot worse than not having enough toilet paper on the shelf be a whole lot worse than that. And if his judgment were to come down on us, we would know it. I think we would know it. Um, but God's showing mercy right now. And one of the reasons the Bible's telling us here about the mercy of God, this God who is willing to hear our cry, who's willing to hear our voice, this God who is who's never, even though the psalmist is struggling a little bit, the psalmist is wondering, where's God, and why is God waiting to pour out his judgment? Really, God is just patiently waiting on repentance, just like we said a while ago. I believe he's also patiently waiting on people to get saved, waiting on, and that's part of that repentance for the saved, right? But, but I believe in America today, that's one of the things that, that God tarries in judging the whole world because there's some people that's supposed to get saved that's not saved yet. And that's why God is patient. It's simply because of that. <clears throat> Consequences of bad choices. Yeah. yeah. That's for sure. Look at chapter 77 and verse 13. It's a good word of wisdom there for everyone, for the world. Your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? <clears throat> You're the God who does wonders. You have declared your strength among the people's. You know, of course, I know their view of a sanctuary and our view of a sanctuary is two different things. They believe that's the house that God dwelled in, and he did in the Old Testament, and they went there to meet with God. So basically that verse is saying, you, O God, your way, O God, is, is there in that place where we meet with you. The good news today is we can meet with God everywhere. You can get up on Monday morning and meet with God on your back porch. But the key is meeting with God. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't go to church. I'm not, definitely not saying that. But it means that if we, we need to meet with God. And that's what the psalmist is saying here. And that's how we would relate to that in the New Testament days. Is make sure you're meeting with God. And that's what the world needs but we're rejecting God as a nation. Not as a nation, but individual people are rejecting God. They're rejecting the absolutes. They're rejecting the fact that there are consequences. We're just rethinking values as a nation right now. And I can't help but relate this to us as a nation. When you rethink whether there is such a thing as right and wrong... Is there such a thing? Because if there's right and wrong, there's got to be consequences for wrong. So if you want to do away with consequences, you have to do away with right and wrong. And that's what we're trying to do. That's, we don't want anybody, we want to do away with the police because we want, don't want anybody deciding what's right and what's wrong. So <clears throat> it's a very dangerous a dangerous uh, thing that we're playing with right now. Experiment. Yeah, it's a slippery slope. Good point, Matt. It's a slippery slope that we're walking on that we're, we're trying to climb up right now, and the end of that slope is destruction. When there is no order, 
there will be destruction. Well, you know what happens if we do away with that? You know what happens? We go back to what Darwin believed, survival of the fittest. Whoever's got the most bullets, whoever's the best shots, gonna survive. Barbarianism is what it is. God brings order, but the devil brings chaos. That's right. All right. Let's see if we can get this. There we go. Psalm 83. Psalm 83. <clears throat> we see how the psalmist is pleading for the judgment on those enemies. I mentioned them a while ago. The Edomites, Moabites, Ishmaelites. Isn't it amazing? Really, you think about it, and those all three, those three tribes right there are all related to descendants of Ishmael. It goes back to the sins of uh, Abraham, Sarah, and uh, how they tried to shortcut and help God. And uh, we see the consequences of that. Psalm 82, verses 2 through 4, we see how the psalmist is questioning the lack of mercy for the needy. <clears throat> Let's look over there right quick. We're down to the last couple of chapters here. I apologize to y'all for my voice. I, but I didn't want to ask anybody else just to step in today and teach this without having time to prepare. Um, God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and the needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. You know, I, I don't know. Maybe it's just the day we live in. I can't read some of this stuff without thinking about the social justice movement today. You know, people that take this further than... I think God intended us to take this. What you're seeing is the ramblings in the mind of Asaph and the worship teams and what things that they're struggling with. They're, again, <clears throat> they're approaching this with this belief. The rich, even though they're wicked, they're being blessed by God. The poor, God just turns a blind eye to them and he doesn't care. That's a wrong understanding of God. That's a wrong understanding of God. God does care about the poor, the orphans or the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. We know that the Bible teaches that God loves those who do justly. He does. You could take this to the extremes and say, well, then, if, if I believe this is doctrine of God, this is the doctrine of God that this, the, psalm, the psalmist is saying right here. If I believe this is the doctrine of God, then I must believe in something like communism. You know that they tried communism in the early church? W.A. Crystal's book says that. That's what he believes. The book of Acts, he believes when people sold what they had and they brought it to the church... And they took it and they divided it up and they gave it so everybody had the same, pretty much. Took care of everybody's needs. W.A. Crystal says that was man's first attempt at communism. <laughs> of course, we know America tried it in the early days. Some of the early colonies tried communism where everybody had the same things. They put everything in a storehouse. Everybody got the same things. Same amount of food, same size house. Everything was the same. It was a total failure. Why was it a total failure? Because some folks are willing to work and some folks wasn't willing to work. And the ones that weren't willing to work thought they ought to have just as much as those who were willing to work. And so we look at this and God is not saying by, because the psalmist says in this verse here that everybody's supposed to have the same thing. That's not what he's saying. God's about everybody having fair opportunities. God's about everybody being treated fairly. I don't believe, you see, as they ask these questions, they're struggling with things. They're struggling with all this in their mind. 
Why is God allowing some people to be poor and fatherless? Do justice to these people. In other words, give them stuff, God, even if maybe they're not willing to work for it. He's not teaching communism here. Please understand that. This is the ramblings. This is what's going on in the mind of the writer of this psalm. Why, in other words, why do some people struggle? And why do the wicked seem to be prosperous? It didn't seem fair to the psalmist. But again, I think there was a flaw in their theology. Again, that's what Jesus took on when he said, you know, the rich man, the man who loves possessions is going to have a hard time being saved. That's why the, the rich young ruler, when he came to Jesus, and Jesus said, man, you need to go get rid of your stuff and then come and follow me. And the rich young ruler said, nah, I'm not getting rid of my stuff. And so he turned away and went away sad without God. So I, I guess what I'm saying to you here today, when you read some of the, the struggles, this is, the, this is what's going on in the mind of the psalmist trying to understand how God could allow some to be poor and basically some to have wealth and how does God balance that out alright uh, in some of these well, I backed up I hit the button and backed up on that alright let's move on God loves us enough to allow us to suffer Bring us to a fuller understanding of his purpose for our life. Somebody explain. I guess when I say suffering there, I said, How does why does God allow there to be needy? Why does God allow there to be the fatherless? The afflicted. Free will choices. Okay, free will choices, but God could stop it if he wanted to. Who else said something? Okay. Why does God allow that suffering, though? Say that one more time. Okay. And, and we learn, and she said, so that we learn to depend on him and draw closer to him. You know, one of the things God wants us to learn is not to trust in things, but to trust in the God of those things. To trust in the Lord and not in the things of God, the things of the earth. <clears throat> Well, in, in those days, it even dealt with maybe slavery and those who were enslaved and uh, not necessarily blacks. I mean, people have been enslaved forever, uh, not just the black that, that came to America. And, uh, and a lot of people... <coughs> right. Oh, you're, you're exact. No doubt. And how do we? Yeah. Well, and we have fed those wrong decisions by allowing such a uh, um, obscenity on computers and everything, and we've just fed that culture, that wicked culture, and nobody wants to stop it. I. We may one day be surprised when we find out how deep it runs. How high up it goes into government or into judges. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, and that's one of those areas that I could definitely help God out with the judgment side of that thing, you know? You know? Um, yeah, there are. There's evil in our world, isn't it? <clears throat> but God does allow suffering. He does allow the poor. He does allow them to, us to have them in our lives. And I, I'm just constantly reminded that life has never been promised us that it would be fair. It's never been promised to us that it would be painless. We go through this short life to get ready for eternity. Keep your eyes on eternity. Keep your eyes on eternity. Even in the early church, there was a slave that was saved before Paul was in church. Yep. Paul said, go back to the master. Yep. He did. He did. And um, that, that, the, that theology doesn't fit very well in our culture today either, does it? Uh, but Paul wasn't there, and even Jesus wasn't there to fight. That wasn't the issue. They were there to fight for physical freedom. They were for spiritual freedom. They wanted people to be saved, and they knew that was more important than anything else, that people be saved. <clears throat> uh, our time is gone, so I want to just finalize these last thoughts here. That look at these verses about God's timing. He's got a plan. He's working things out in his sovereign plan. Uh, when I choose the proper time, it said in Psalm 75, verse 2, I will judge uprightly. Just remember, things are on God's timetable, not our timetable. He sees, I like to say this about God. He sees around corners. We don't. He sees what's around the corners. Sees the whole picture. He does. There's a time for every purpose under the sun, under heaven. In Romans five six. When and even when when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. All right. Um, when God is silent about suffering and injustice, we must remember His goodness and His timing. My thoughts and my ways are not like basically not like your thoughts and your ways. Does justice and mercy contradict each other? Now, mercy is something that is undeserved, all right? Uh, sometimes God may show mercy by not allowing us to do something that will lead to our demise, which would also be a just thing for him to do for us. So, again, we just don't see the whole picture of God, do we? And close it out. In conclusion... Psalm 79 asks, How long, O Lord, will you be angry forever? Will your jealousy burn like fire? We know God's not going to be angry forever. And God hears them when they cry to them. But in their mind, it seems like the judgment. Can you imagine if we woke up and communism had taken over America? You know? Russia and China would love to team up right now with the help of Iran and North Korea and Turkey and a few others and do their part to, to bring America down. What if we woke up in a nation that we didn't recognize anymore? Would we think God had forgotten us? Or would we maybe be... Would we have enough wisdom to say maybe this is the consequences of our choices? And don't think for a minute God can't use godless nations to judge righteous nations. He sure can. He's did it, done it for Israel several times. That's right. That's right. National sins can lead to national judgment and that we all have to be a part of. Israel's developing in these psalms we read tonight. Uh, they're developing a healthy fear of God. God's bringing them back to that place where they see and understand better the wrath of God and the fear of God. And that fear leads for a plea for restoration right here at the end. It says in Psalm 80, 
Three times it says in Psalm 80, Restore us, God. Make your face shine on us so that we may be saved. If we don't, if we as a nation don't get to this prayer, oh God, save us. And we don't just need to be saved physically, we need to be saved spiritually as a nation. And so sometimes we go through the suffering, we go through the times when we think God has lost us or forgotten us. And it's in those times that God's, <clears throat> here's what I see in these Psalms. An internal discussion about where is God? What's God doing? Why is he not doing it like we think and like we want? And God's sitting back waiting on them to get to this place that says, God, make your face shine on us again. Save us. Restore us. Because until we get there, we don't have a hope. We don't have hope. And sometimes God's got to let us go through the stupid things to get back to that place, to work our way around that cycle and get back to that place where we see the truth. All right? Well, that's kind of where this is tonight. I, I don't like having to do 11 chapters in one night. I'm not very good at that. I'm just kind of trying to pull some of the high points out of it. And follow your book pretty close. Most all of this is in your book. Okay? Let's stand and we'll be dismissed. <clears throat> Wayne, how about you dismiss us? <clears throat>